Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our Walking Writers Salon and our guest is Torbjorn uh, Eckeland, uh, magazine editor turned author and um, he's written three philosophical books, uh, The Boy on the Mountain, A Year in the Woods and In Praise of Paths, uh, which we'll be discussing tonight. And uh, if any of you are new to the salons, uh, just a quick, uh, a little bit about Walk, Listen, Crate. Um, we were, um, uh, we set this up about two or three uh, years ago and became a, 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 an official social enterprise last year. And what we try to do is support artists, composers, performers, and sound designers who create work on foot or about walking. And uh, we have an ongoing project, which is called Shorelines, which we'd love uh, any writers to pitch into. This is an opportunity where you can write a short piece um, and uh, submit it and uh, share it with your friends and invite them to read it aloud. And they can record uh, their reading aloud directly from the computer, from the web page. And so we, uh, we're building up a sort of a collection of uh, writing and reading aloud uh, of Shorelines or, uh, across the world. Um, coming up, uh, sorry, strange talk about what's happening next when we haven't even started this one. Uh, but what we have uh, coming up next is we have uh, on the 24th of May, we have Electra Rhodes, who I know is known to some of you, because she runs our creative writing courses. Uh, Electra is, um, she's written a piece about, uh, well, it's called A Walk to Bardsey, which is, uh, I believe, somewhere in Yorkshire, but I have to um, show my ignorance. I, I don't know myself, but that's coming on the 24th of May. So, um, uh, how the salon works, as I said, uh, Tilborn and I will chat for 15, 20 minutes. We'll open up for questions and wait for it. We end with a multiple choice quiz. And so, we have to thank Greystone Books, uh, Stone Books in uh, Vancouver, which is the publisher of In Praise of Paths in English, um, because they're going to uh, provide us with printed copies of books and mail them to you. So, um, this is unheard of. We're, we're actually in the e-business um, uh, to try to avoid the cost of postage, but uh, um, Greystone are very grace, uh, gracefully going to mail printed copies. So we'll see how that gets on. So our guest is uh, Tjorbjorn uh, Eklund. He's a Norwegian nature writer, editor of Harvest magazine, which you might tell us a bit about. He writes literary nonfiction. Uh, he says his books include Praise of Paths, uh, a Year in the Woods and The Boy on the Mountain, and they'd been translated into English, German, Italian, Spanish, Korean, Catalonian, Dutch, and Chinese. And he's currently working on a book about birds, uh, scheduled for publication in the autumn. Um, he lives in Oslo with his wife and two children. So um, it's been a real pleasure for me to, to read his book. I've actually read it a couple of times. Uh, I found it really insightful and charming. I thought I knew everything there was to know about walking. Um, and he's reaffirmed some of the things I knew, uh, but he's actually made me think quite differently about my own experiences about walking. So, Tjorvon, would you like to start by telling us um, why did you choose the title? Well, uh, actually, the, the Canadian publisher chose that title because the Norwegian title is... Uh, is uh, the history of the path or something like that. It's probably, I guess, uh, it's a word that uh, isn't that easily translated. So, but they spoke to me and we had a, we had a little chat about the title and um, we ended up uh, with uh, In Praise of Parts, uh, which is a title I really like because it, it says something about, um, I, I don't know how to say it, but the attitude of the book or something like that. It's I'm not critical to to pass. It's not a critical investigation, but more uh, yeah, more of a praise. So I guess that's the reason. And then uh, the subtitle is uh, Andrew. You can uh, easily easily see it behind you because I haven't got the English copy here. But it, it's uh, a journey through time and nature, isn't it? Uh, yes, so, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I should, I should remember. I know, I don't remember the Chinese either. But um, so the subtitle with the journey uh, perspective is uh, very important for me. I think because it 
it describes a journey, not one journey or not, not a big one, not any particular journey, but journeys in general and, and through nature and with, uh, with uh, using our two feet, so walking through nature, which is, uh, you know, the thing the book is um, about. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of more here in the UK, we're, we, we, we tend to talk about walking routes and trails. Uh, but uh, you, you actually reveal a sort of significant distinction between those words. What, so uh, can you can you sort of tell us a bit more about uh, paths and what paths mean to you? Well, the Norwegian word for path is sti. Uh, and we actually, we don't have uh, two words as you do. It's always like that every time you, you have, uh, you have several words to describe more or less the same thing. Uh, always, uh, if I, to translate something from English to Norwegian, uh, I'm, you know, I'm in lack of words. So uh, the word sti, path in, in Norwegian, describes uh, the one that's made without purpose. I can probably, it's a good definition. It, it's, nobody has, uh, you know, uh, decided to make a path or a trail uh it's just you know it's just uh, become uh, something in nature because people have walked uh, on the same place several times or many times and that's probably uh it's a very important thing in my book because um i try to emphasize that a path uh is in many ways a story because it tells something about decisions people have made uh, when they have been walking through nature and these decisions are not uh, you know they're not coincidental they're they're based on some basic uh, ability to to navigate through nature so i guess that's a path in my in my um, in my book that's more or yeah, less I, what I, I, think I about. you talk about also you talk about people following the route of least resistance which i think is yeah. quite yeah so i mean we don't we don't walk a straight path. We we tend to follow the the easiest, uh, less 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 struggle. We always do, and you can even see it in the middle of London. If you have a you know a ninety degrees angle, and there in the, on the pavement or something, and there is a lawn on the inside, you will almost definitely see a path crossing that lawn. So, and and I my theory is that that decision is of course made in a uh, in an instant and it has to do with we will consider is it more exhausting to walk on the on the on the on the grass if the the answer is no it's flat and nice it's a lawn then we go there if it's a fence or if it's uh, you know some trees or something we can't get past we will follow the payment in the 90 degrees uh, angle so um, I write a lot about that actually and I spoke to which which I was really interesting I don't know what you call it in English but when you're running the, it's a competition when you're running in in, uh, in the forest or in the mountains and you have this map and you have yeah, to get to yeah we call it orienteering Ex excellent it's called orienteering in Norwegian as well so <laughs> <laughs> but I spoke to him and he's he's the coach of the national team Norwegian team and they're pretty good uh, and I spoke to him and asked him to describe to me or to tell me what's uh, how, how does it work? How, how do they do it? What's the most important thing to think about? And uh, he, he said to me that um, it's always uh, the path of least resistance. You have to read the landscape. You have to understand if there is a, you know, if there is a wetlands, you can't follow a straight line. You have to go through. You have to go. You have to keep uh, high in the landscape, on the ridges and stuff like that. All these things he described to me was very interesting. And and um, and I asked him uh, from where, when did we learn this? And he said, animals. They learn it from the an they look for the animal trails, the paths made by uh, moose, especially in in Norway in the in the deep forests. So I walked there myself and, and you know, carefully looked at the 
the moose trails and and I, I found them and they were um, definitely very you know smart smart way uh, ways to to walk through the landscape so that that was very interesting because i in one of the chapters in my book i i take the train north from oslo there is a huge forest uh, very close to oslo um and i took the train to the other side of the um, of the forest the, the northern side and uh, I think it's about in a straight line it would probably be 35 40 kilometers uh, and w uh, I, uh, me and a friend of mine we we were trying to walk back to Oslo without any means of navigation we didn't have a map we didn't have a GPS uh, it was a very uh, strange uh, experience you should all try it it doesn't really need to be a very big forest because because it was a lot harder than I thought. Ah, right. Because if, when you choose the road of least resistance and you don't go in a straight line, you lose, you lose track of uh, directions immediately, immediately. And then, uh, as I found out, the one thing is to start from a point that you know and then walk into the forest. But then after a while, you actually start from a point you don't know where it is. So you're actually lost when you start walking and then everything is a total mess <laughs> so we walked oh, wow. for um, i think we walked for uh, almost 20 hours and afterwards we um, we checked uh, the distance and we had walked uh, 25 kilometers i think and uh, the straight line was uh, five kilometers so we have walked in a very a very very strange uh, manner but it was fun. Uh, you should all try it. We should all try it. Okay. Well, so uh, one of the things you talk about actually is walking barefoot. Were you doing that at the same time? Were you barefooting it? And what yeah. what, what brought you I, to walk barefoot? Tell us. I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't really know. But um, uh, as uh, it it feels comfortable in a strange way. So uh, I've actually started now because uh, you you have uh, had nice weather in in England for for uh, weeks already, Andrew. I know be, because you told me the last time we spoke. But it's here. It's been cold, but now it's probably I don't know 10 degrees Celsius or something. So I've actually started walking barefoot now. And when you do it in the beginning in spring, it's uh, really painful. It's really painful. But after a while, your uh, skin thickens and well, it becomes comfortable in a strange way. And socks become uh, totally claustrophobic after a while. It's terrible to put them on. Sometimes I have to and I, I don't like it. So And, uh, and also, um, you don't get wet. Or you get wet, but you dry up in ten seconds. So, so it's a good thing. You should all try it. It's a sure, little sure. Uh, strange when you do it in the cities, but uh, so I don't really do it with my wife and two children. They uh, they tend to be a bit embarrassed if I do it, but uh, in nature I do it as often right. as possible. Now, t tell us something because, um, like Scotland, Norway appears to have a right to roam. Um, a, a huge issue now in the UK. Uh, we've uh, uh, we have a sort of mass trespass going on uh, over this weekend, actually coming up, yeah. uh, with protesters protesting about the fact that they don't have access to the countryside. I think we we have only about eight percent of the countryside which is accessible. Really? Um, really? Although we have a, a myriad of what's called rights of way, which are yeah. paths that we can take. Um, but um, is you know it, 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 it for nor for Norwegians is there no need to have sort of government protection for that right to roam? I mean it's just accepted, is it that you can go anywhere? I think it's uh, yeah it's called uh, allemansretten uh, this uh, this uh, uh, law more or less it says that everybody has the right to walk everywhere really. Uh, the only thing you have to respect is to, if you're camping, for instance, uh, maintain a certain distance from uh, people's houses and farms. But I think, uh, to me, it seems like everybody is very used to it and everybody likes it. Um, there's some trouble along the coast uh, in summer, uh, people with uh, 
with houses there. They, they tend to big fen the, build the big fences, but more or less, uh, most people are, you know, they respect it. Um, I don't know why, but probably because it has been a, a very long tradition. Uh, and also, of course, because uh, uh, there's so uh, a few people here. So there's space enough for everybody. I, I also think actually it has something to do with the fact that it snows a lot and that snowing, a snow is one of those things that changes the landscape completely. Yeah. And that, you know, if you have um, boundaries, uh, you know, the snow just sort of kind of evens out all the textures and yeah. that it makes it really difficult to know whether you're on the pavement or the footway or the or whatever in a city and children come out and play in the snow and you know there are no cars driving around or very far fewer cars so mm. you, you know you get a completely changed atmosphere and environment and i think uh, when you look at places where right to roam is you often get uh you know places which are um uh you, you know are, are uh, get snow. So Scotland gets snow and Norway gets yeah, snow. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. <laughs> okay, so uh, good. We've got a couple of questions already in the chat. Just to remind people, please put questions in the chat. I've got a whole list of questions and of course I have the advantage that I've read the book. Um, I haven't asked how many people have read the book in the audience, So because uh, the book has been published for a couple of years now in English. Um, anyway, another uh, question for you really is that um, uh, I mean, this is part childhood memoir, isn't it? It's sort of a kind of um, uh, part rural. Yeah, I mean, you evoke past times, the sort of rural idyll, and and the changes that have taken place over your lifetime. Mm. And, um, and and what's the um, and and you and and you you develop quite a lot of discussion around walking as a child and how that differs from walking as an adult. Do you want to sort yeah. of kind of tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, it started uh, with uh, the book I wrote before, In Praise of Parts, uh, which is a book about uh, a hike I, I took with my son. He was, I think, six years old when we walked uh, this uh, in a, you know, a very, uh, quite rough terrain, a small mountain area, not far from Oslo. And uh, I was walking behind him. Uh, my, my plan was to make him decide where to go, how far to go before we set camp, and really basically everything what to do. And I was walking behind him and I, uh, and I uh, saw how he, he wasn't able to, uh, to uh, how do you say it? Uh, he used all his energy immediately when he felt, uh, you know, strong, and then when he felt tired, he just lay down on the on the on the path, and then he got something to eat and something to drink, and then he started climbing some uh, some rocks and stuff like that. So I, it was very interesting to observe how he was, uh, you know, walking through the landscape, and I think probably. That was one of the things that made me write about my own childhood in in uh, in Praise of Parts, because I was um, you know in, in Norway it's a very it's a tra tradition to in the weekends you go out in the mountains or in the forests and you go for a walk and you camping and all that stuff. We used to do that a lot and we had we had a small cabin and behind that cabin was a was a path. But we always walked, um, my mother and father and my two sisters. And I didn't really plan to write about that path in the book, but I don't, I can't really remember uh, when and why, but um, at some point I started thinking about it because it really has to do with all the things I write about. And the first thing that happened was that I started wondering how long was this path? of my childhood. And I hadn't been there for, I don't know, 35, I think I write it in the book, 35 years or something, even probably even more. So the only place this path was existed was in my uh, memory. So I went back there and I write about it in, um, it's the last chapter, I think. Uh, when I come back to the cabin and I walk the, this uh, path, again, it's, it's a completely, 
it has completely disappeared in the landscape because um, it used to be a, a lot of paths, probably most of them. Uh, they have um, come into being due to labor work. People are cutting timber in the forests. They have the cows, the sheep, all these things. So, and that little path was such a path as well. Uh, but because people uh, work in uh, the cities and in offices and factories, it had completely disappeared. But I found it and I walked it and afterwards I went into Google Maps to find out uh, the distance and it was 350 meters. And in my memory it was uh, probably, I don't know, a million miles. A day's journey <laughs> or half a day's journey. <laughs> yeah, half a day's journey. Completely exhausting. So that was a very, very interesting thing for me to do. and. It also made me realize, uh, and that's probably one of the most important um, insights uh, for me personally in the book, that paths are stories. They, are, they contain stories about human life, about labor uh, and uh, leisure time and everything. So there is probably what a path has uh, come into being, um, because many people have walked the same way and they must have had a reason to walk that way. And that reason uh, I was, you know, trying to find or interested in finding out more about. Um, well, um, what we usually do is we try to ask some practical questions about your writing technique, because this is meant to be about writing and walking. So yeah. we, we, we ask you something along those lines. That's but very I'm, interesting. I, I, I said in the introduction that you're a magazine editor. So how easy was it for you to switch from writing to, you know, like short essays or short pieces where you're having to write to a deadline uh, and probably quite a regular deadline? How, how was that for you to switch to writing a much longer form and perhaps having less pressure on, your, on, the, on, on writing it? It's a very good question. Uh, it's a, it's you know million dollar question because I think most most people that are used to write short pieces work in a newspaper or a magazine or even if you just write for your own amusement when they start uh, if they decide to write a book and they start writing it they will be finished very soon <laughs> uh, uh, probably on page twenty or something like that and then you you end up wondering. Uh, uh, why? How did I end up um, at the end so very quickly? And for me, I think it, my best advice is that you have to stay in the situations much longer when you write a book. You have to tell yourself that you have all the time and all the space in the world. So you have to, uh, you ha in a way, you have to dig deeper uh, when it comes to basically everything you write about. So let's say you walk uh, on a path. Uh, if you walk, if you go for a walk, and then you on a Sunday afternoon, and you come back home, and decide to write a book about it, then you really have to think: What did I experience? Uh, you have to recollect the details of the experience, what you th were thinking about, uh, all these things: the landscape, the weather, everything, uh, and. It's, it feels very unusual, at least it did for me, because I've been writing for 25 years. It's been my job for, for many years. But uh, it also felt very, very satisfying. Really, really satisfying. And then I started to develop, because I've written these three books, and, uh, and I'm work, we're, uh, working on my fourth now, I started to, to develop a sort of technique uh, which basically is that I never take notes anymore. This is nature writing. I never take notes. I always uh, write when I come back home so that the story is uh, as I remembered. That's very important for me. So uh, the truth, if you like, is uh, 
the experience as remembered by me afterwards. Uh, for me, it makes it a lot easier to to you know to to write about it. It makes it or to interpret the experience or or. So you should all try that if you write. You you, you should try to if you write about nature, maybe especially uh, try to walk out or do whatever you're planning to do, and then when you come back, you write about it. No notes, no nothing, because if you see uh, a bird singing in a tree. It's the bird that you remember when you come back home uh, to your computer. That's the bird you saw. That's my uh, that's my way of thinking. It's not the real bird, but it's the, the bird uh, that you remember. Okay, well that's great. Well, let's see whether people have put questions in the in the chat and see if we can invite them to uh, to ask them. Um, mm -hmm. So, Bob, do you want to ask a question? I'm a performance artist. Uh, my first yeah. performance act was when I was in San Francisco in 65 and mm -hmm. I stepped outside of a hotel and I had to decide whether to go to the right or to go to the left. So yeah. it was like a decision. And I'm just wondering, you're talking about a path and in my case it's me what, that does it, but in the case it's the path which is walked upon, which is mm -hmm. different to the self, but it's something there. But both of them a writable about of all. Once you start mm. being conscious of the act of uh, making a decision to go right or left, or making a decision to walk along the path, you've started the trajectory. Do you have any commentary on that process? Well, as I uh, as I understand you, uh, you, are you talking about the coins or the how how do you use, which English word is it used? Like when you're saying that you can walk right or left, you're in San Francisco, so you're not you don't know the area. You go, walk out of the hotel, and you That's get it. to choose right or left. Yeah, I mean, I, I make I could go straight across the road, but that would be suicidal. So right or left yeah, along yeah, the so side is the only way it can go. <laughs> Whatever, but rather than not do anything. I make a decision yeah. to do something, and then when I made the decision to do something, I have to either decide to go right or to go left. That process of the decision of what to do is to do with the act of walking. Yeah. And then trying to link it with the object of the path rather than myself, because that's instructing myself. So when I get on a path, I then decide, do I go along the path or do I go back on the path? But this way of thinking gives me it puts me into words, so it's words that are dictating my actions, yeah. either yeah. on the path. Just, do you have any reflection on on that? Is that, is it? Could you recognise anything in that in in relation to writing? I can, because as uh, as you describe it, if I understand you right, uh, the way you describe it, uh, it makes me think of uh, total freedom. Yes. You you walk out of a hotel, you can walk yes. left or right. Uh, it's total yeah. freedom. You get yeah, to yeah. choose. And you can leave the path as well. I write yeah. about leaving the path. So yeah. um, it, co it corresponds in my in my world, it corresponds perfectly with writing. Uh -huh. It's like, it's, it's almost the same act. You know, like yeah. walking, choosing your way, deciding yeah. where to go. It's... Um, in 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 my in my world, it's more or less the same as writing because writing is also total freedom. You can do oh, whatever awesome. you want. So it's it's total freedom. The process of writing is is I don't know. Yeah, total freedom. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it reminds in a way of walking, walk, walking, writing. For me, it's very similar activities. It has something to do with you know like how the brain works. When you write, if you get into this flow um, condition, and the same with walking, if you get into this flow when you walk, your your mind starts to wander as well. And, and there's I, I, this... oh, yeah, there's I was going to say, this... oh, oh sorry, sorry, Bob, I was going to say, Adam, uh, I don't know, Adam, you you actually mentioned about this, the idea of drifting and and wandering. Do you want to mention anything about that, Adam? He's written something rather than said it. So can you read that? Uh, right. He said, writing for me is very personal and subjective process, and so is walking. But one also draws on knowledge as well as impulse. 
So one gets the spontaneity down to a fine art. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I like that. I like that. It's, um, yeah. It's, it, it, they, it, all these descriptions has to do with, um, I think, uh, freedom, as we mentioned, you need to, you need to be brave enough in many ways. People are always a little frightened when they write, you know, like you, you go for a walk and then, um, come back and have to write about it and writing about it is one thing, but uh, then so if you, if you know that some, somebody's going to read it, then it gets really, really, really scary. Uh, that, uh, which is very natural, especially if you haven't published anything before, and and especially with books because they are also, you know, going to end up being reviewed maybe in a newspaper, and somebody might even say that this is a shitty book. <laughs> so you have to be brave, and you have to think that uh, the thing I've written is uh, the thing I wanted to write. I'm happy about it, uh, independent on what other people. Uh, think and then I uh, I also believe that that's the only way you can write or in in my uh, situation describe nature as you experience it because nobody's interested in a general objective description of nature that you can read that in uh, you know on the on Wikipedia for for that sake so you need to be brave and you need to find out what's what have I seen? Um, what is it I have seen? And how do I describe to other people what I've seen? I've had some lectures in Norway for people that want to write about nature. And I always say because uh, Norwegians are very, have a very romantic relationship to nature, uh, which is okay, I do as well. But I've, I always tell them that if you go to the mountains on a sunny day, uh, and you come back and you're going to write about it. If you start, if your first sentence is, it was a wonderful day in the mountains, then you, you've you made yourself very uninteresting because that tells me that, okay, you experienced the same as everybody else that went to the mountain these days. So there is nothing here uh, that I can, you know, that can make me any, uh, wiser or tell me anything about the mountains. So I think that's a process as well that you need to find things to compare it with. So I, uh, I think I've just written about Krauss and I was sitting earlier today and uh, I, uh, describing a scene where I walked through a forest in, in late fall and it's getting dark and it's foggy and uh, you know the leaves have fallen down only these uh, black huge trees and crows in them flying and screaming and stuff like that and i was thinking about what does this remind me of uh this this uh, scene that i i see before me and i ended up with uh, a deserted parking lot it reminds me of a parking lot somewhere in uh, in the us probably something i've seen in a movie for me, it's very effective to use to compare nature to civilization. So using, for instance, a city when you're going to describe something in nature is very effective and also often makes good literature because comparing nature to nature when you're in nature is uh, pretty difficult and not very, not very effective really. So. Uh, that's an advice as well for me that uh, always think if you, you know, like metaphors or stuff like that, think about the opposite. Think about Manhattan or something like that. So so you get the, then you get the picture. I'm, I'm, it's I'm, it's I'm, a very I'm, good thing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be mischievous and say, um, well, you'll probably find out that people who live in nature, I um, don't actually read about, I don't read nature writing. And it's nope. only people who sit in city who who live in the city that read nature writing. But I've no idea. That's me being. I silly. think you're you're probably quite right, Andrew. You're probably quite right. <laughs> they don't have the. I don't. They. they I, I don't think they have a uh, have a need to describe nature because it's it's it surrounds them and and it has always does so. 
so they don't really, you know, they don't really, they, they don't observe it uh, the same way you do if you live in the middle of London and then go out on the countryside on a nice sunny afternoon. Now, um, uh, Michelle, if you're there, you've, you've asked a question which is a bit more practical or a bit more contextual. So would you like to ask it? Michelle, can you give me a uh, thumbs up on the question? Do you think that Norwegian children grow up with a strong connection to nature? Yeah, Is it that's the question? The yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I think I think they do. Um, uh, probably, I don't know, maybe more than the average child uh, on this planet. Uh, it is a tradition in Norway uh, to, to bring children out in nature, uh, uh, more or less as soon as possible, I guess. Uh, and uh, I think it's been so for, uh, I've written about that as well, but, but there is a term in, in Norwegian called, I think you, you will get back to it, Andrew, called friluftsli, which uh, basically means life in the free air. And uh, it was first written by uh, Henrik Ibsen, the play, the playwright, the Norwegian playwright, 150 years ago or something like that. So that marks the beginning of that tradition, uh, which basically consists in families going out in the weekends, especially maybe to the mountains, which is very popular, but also in the woods and uh, along the coastline and stuff like that. So I think in Norway, uh, I like it, but I dislike it a little bit as well because. Uh, I think an, a, a, an average Norwegian will think that if you are not in nature in your spare time, uh, you're not as good as person as uh, the one who actually is. And of course, this has something to do with uh, social class, definitely. So the upper classes have done it a lot more than the, you know the. The lower classes in society, but then again, Norwich, uh, the no uh, Norway is a pretty, you know, equal country, I guess. So a lot of people do it, but it has to do with that tradition, and it has to do with, you know, the polar explorers and stuff like that. They become became great idols for, uh, especially in the beginning of uh, past century. So. Uh, it has something to do with them, uh, and it's it used to be a very masculine ideal. I think they were not, you know, like beard with ice in it and stuff like that, which so, I sometimes yeah. fi sometimes find quite boring. <laughs> uh, they're very good, good at skiing and they're bad at writing. What we need to know is, Michelle, did that answer your question? Because you can just say wave at us because we can't hear you. Oh, thumbs up! You get the thumbs up. That's oh, great. great. And, um, okay, well, an, another practical question. Uh, you know, do you, do you write nine to five? Do you know, what, are you a sort of five days a week, nine to five sort of writer? Does your can, can you tell us a bit about your magazine, maybe? Uh, do you know, is that does that make you have to be a nine to five writer? No, I'm completely free because me and three three friends we own the magazine, so there's no adults or no bosses telling us to. To meet uh, at the office at nine o'clock in the morning. So uh, I have been for probably fifteen years a freelancer. So I get to decide everything myself. Uh, and the magazine actually started in many ways uh, my writing, uh, my book writing career because we. I've always been a very, very um, dedicated fly fisher. And I've always, you know, read the fly fishing magazines, and they're all about getting these huge fish all the time. And when I was a child, I was really excited to see, you know, the the, the pictures of the huge uh, trout and salmon. But then, uh, I don't know. At some point, I I didn't find it very interesting anymore. And my friend, one of my colleagues in Harvest, thought the same. So we decided that we would start a magazine about nature and uh, stuff like that, uh, where writing was the most important thing. And we had a little uh, sentence uh, that we used as a kind of guidance. And that was that if we're going to write a book, uh, an article about fishing, there will be no fish in the article. 
that was the that was the way it started. So I'm completely free, and and uh, I think uh, my advice to everybody who, who who's writing and uh, wants to write more is that you have to find out when your brain works best. And I'm pretty sure that it is a certain uh, time of day or night uh, that it works a lot better than uh, other times. So for me, it's early in the morning. I start maybe like, especially now, the children are a little older and they can manage by their own. So I start at seven o'clock in the morning and uh, without checking emails, without doing anything. Uh, and then I start writing and I write for four hours and then I'm completely exhausted. So if you really, really uh, focus and concentrate for four hours, it's like running a marathon. Uh, but then the nice thing is that then it's only 11 o'clock in the morning still. So I have a lot of time, but then, then I answer emails and do all, all other sorts of things. But for me, it's very important to be, to start without having had any other impressions, so to speak, that the, the brain, the mind is, uh, is, uh, totally blank. That's the way I try to do it. And I always try two, two more things. I always stop writing when I think it's really fun. Uh, and when I feel like I'm getting down some uh, good stuff, always stop in the middle of something really fun. Uh, I never stop when I'm frustrated. Then I force myself to continue until I, I'm, I'm happy with the thing I write. And um, I always read uh what i wrote the day before before i start writing it i don't really know why i do it like that but but it's a uh, very i think it's very smart to try to develop a kind of method i think it's uh i think it will serve every writer to have a very conscious uh, uh mind when it comes to these in a way very practical things well, uh, Bob, Bob, Bob has come up with another follow-up question, but to be honest, uh, Bob, I think you've actually answered it in what you've written. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> do you want to uh, just touch on that? Follow-up question about absolute freedom. Of all the physical activities, it seems that walking is the most direct to experiencing total freedom. Because like you just walk, you don't have to put any special clothes on or anything. You, could, you don't have to fill up with petrol. You can just do it. And that linking it in with writing through walking is a way in, in writing to touch that same total freedom. So your choice of um, walking and linking it in with writing seems to be the simplest way and the most direct way to experience it. it absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, good. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's like uh, two versions of stream of consciousness. They exactly. correspond perfectly. And somehow walking you get this dialogue in your head, which is really yeah. clear writing. And somehow when, as you can do, focus over those four hours of absolute writing, you get that physical release. So it's a, a, almost a mirror image only in, in, in it, it is, It's a mirror image, it definitely is. And I would very much like if it was possible to put something in my brain and have a transcription, is that what you call it, of all the thoughts. That that goes around in uh, in uh, in my head when walking, and I also have. I think there is another thing about it, and that's the speed of walking. It corresponds perfectly with the speed, or it it makes the brain or the thoughts and everything. Uh, it slows them down. Yeah, it really slows them down. At least I I I experienced that. Me too. Yeah, got it. Thank you. And you need some slowness if you're going to write some uh, some good stuff. It needs to, oh, you yeah. need some slowness. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Tjubon, that's terrific. But most importantly, we need to thank Tjubon for uh, joining us all the way from Oslo. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit, finally, Tjubon, about your your next book. It's not about fly fishing. It's about birds. Yeah, there's some. Uh, I, I struggle writing about fishing after that decision uh, not to have any fish in the article. So 
it's about birds and it, it's it was very uh, very strange because I've really not paid much attention to birds bef until three four years ago four or five years ago when when I started writing this book and uh, it's really fun and an amazing uh, uh, thing to write about uh, difficult of course because there's so many people uh, there's so many books about birds already but uh, I find it really 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 funny and challenging so it's called it's going to be called Requiem for a Bird Field notes from a, from a world that's disappearing, something like that. So uh, hopefully it will be published in Norwegian in the winter of uh, 23, and then I hope that uh, Greystone will uh, translate it as well and publish it later that year or probably the year after. So um, I'll get up in the morning, start writing at seven o'clock, and then. Uh, you know, if I uh, if I stay stay to it and do not give up, it will be a book. But it's it's really um, it's hard work writing. Well, thank you very much for sharing your writing experience and especially for writing in Praise the Path. And I've got a couple more books to read yet, so uh, I've got a yeah. child in the mountain uh, <laughs> to read. Yet. So I'll look forward to that. Anyway, thanks thank once again. One and um, good luck with everything. And um, thank you for inviting me, Andrew. It was okay. a great pleasure to talk to Brilliant. you. And thanks and you guys. everyone. Else. All right, cheerio, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.